Welcome to Disruptive Successor, a show for next generation leaders in family businesses and entrepreneurs who want to disrupt the status quo and take their existing business to a whole new level. We all know that what got us here isn't going to get us there. This show will provide inspiration, advice, and resources to help you create massive impact. Hi, Jonathan Goldhill, your host here of the Disruptive Successor Podcast. Welcome back to another show episode. And today I'm really excited to have my new friend, Spencer Shanin from Vancouver, where you can see in the background the sun is setting. And he is going to talk a little bit about his new book. It's a mouthful to say. It's one word, though. It's Entrepreneurs. You have to have good embouchure to say that. So welcome to the show, Spencer. And uh, let me give you a little uh, fair bio. So, so Spencer is an entrepreneur and runs an accounting firm, which is what you don't think of as typically entrepreneurial, but he's a serial entrepreneur and has a CPA, was in a family business with his father. He'll tell us a little bit about that. Um, he speaks both the language of accounting and entrepreneurship and has created a system to bridge the gap between the two. He's a best-selling author. His book is called Entrepreneur Numbers, The Surprisingly Simple Path to Financial Clarity. So let's start with that because financial clarity is anything but clear for most small businesses. And why is that? Why don't people get finances? I mean, what's with that? Totally. Well, thanks. I'm super stoked to be here. It's great to see you again. Um, yeah, that, that's a really great question. You know, why do we get stuck in the mud with our books, with finance, that whole thing? And really, I think there's a couple of key reasons. You said it a little bit in my intro, but you know, accounting is its own language. It's actually a technical language. That I went to school for three years to learn how to write, interpret, create financial statements, read them, prepare them. And most entrepreneurs didn't do that, came up through some whatever skill they had and that turned into a business or you know, took over a family business or whatever it is. And so you know, we just don't have that, that knowledge, that experience. I mean, I, I think about like, imagine if somebody handed you an EKG. Well, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines unless you actually know how to like technically read it. And you know, I don't know how. So that, that's one of the problems, but one of the real problems, and I think the bigger one, uh, particularly for entrepreneurs, is what I call the accounting stack problem. And if you think about uh, building a house, you're going to build a dream home, right? Who do you have there? Your main contact. That's going to be the general contractor. And the general contractor is going to have a bunch of sub trades, you know, plumbers, electricians, the carpenters. And then there's also going to be potentially, depending on the size of the project, a laborer or two hauling lumber, hauling cement, sweeping up, digging ditches. Well, we all know that and that's super intuitive, but honestly that same stack exists in the accounting department, but it's actually different. Instead of the, the general contractor, you have a director of finance or CFO. They're the, they're the quarterback. You know, instead of the sub trades, you have a controller. They're the ones doing your reporting and compliance. And then instead of a laborer, you have a bookkeeper. They're the ones doing the day-to-day -day transactions. And so for small businesses, Usually, well, we just can't afford the entire accounting stack, so we end up a bookkeeper running our entire accounting department, and that's kind of like hiring a laborer to build you a house. They yeah. probably know some plumbing, they'll know some carpentry, they'll know kind of little bits of everything, but they haven't necessarily been trained or are looking at life from the angles that we really need to have a successful accounting department. So between the language problem and the not having the right people in place problem, you know, we end up kind of upside down in our books a lot of the time. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate. Uh, fortunately, I don't see too much of this anymore with the companies that I'm working with. But in years past, I worked a lot with uh, contractors and yeah. I still do. And many of them were million to five million dollar landscape contractors yeah. and it was typically you know started by the husband and the wife did the books yeah. and quickbooks is such an easy program to learn but their chart of accounts was a mess they ran all sorts of stuff you know what keith cunningham calls like yaya -ya expenses right. um through the book so so that complicates so we don't and then the, the notion of job costing, which is so important if you're yeah. doing that type of uh, work, construction work, 
um, was just too hard to get at. So yeah, sound no, familiar? And, <laughs> and, that, and that's kind of a, a big part of almost like that accounting stack, right? Like the, the bookkeeping isn't usually the problem. The problem is you don't have the controller or the CFO to be the quarterback. And so you talked about the chart of accounts. That's the reporting and compliance function. We forget about the compliance and it's, well, frankly, it's boring stuff. Like most accountants don't even like that, right? So right. entrepreneurs like it even less. And so, yeah, things like the chart of accounts, things like policies and procedures, things like selecting the accounting software and or whatever add-ons you have if it's a cloud-based system. All of those things is a specialty. And if, you know, like, yeah, it's, people don't know what they don't know when it comes to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that I found when I started interviewing CPAs 20 plus years ago was that there were a very few of them and they were what I would call like entrepreneurs because they were really a breed apart from everybody else in the business. And one in particular, he liked to predict the future. And mm. literally, he'd be like, let's make your next year's financial statements. Like, let's produce them now yeah, and wow. let's predict what you're going to do. And, and I've had a couple of clients that have been very good at forecasting and come within 1% of their revenues, their gross profit, their net profit. What, yeah. what, what does it take for them to do that? It's a mystery to some of us. But yeah. I, think it's the, I think it's the amount of time they spend in the financial part of their business. What, well, what are your thoughts? I, I totally agree. And I think there's actually kind of another element that's layered on top of that is those people I'm assuming are going to also be really diligent at understanding where they are every month. So when you're on top of your numbers every month and when there's a surprise, say, in the, you know, it's uh, today, it's, it's November 12th today. So we're, you know, we're going to be looking at our October numbers. If something's not right in October and really understanding what happened or what went wrong in October, really getting clear on those things you know, you have to have that solid current base in order to project the future. And for me, for those that are not so financially inclined, I'm a huge fan of turning your financials into pictures, right? Like, you know, imagine a basic stock chart where you see, you know, uh, the, 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 what the stock price is and then how many uh, uh, shares were sold in a day. You can in two seconds see those spikes when the share price went up or when there was a lot of activity in buying and selling. Those things, you don't actually have to be a, a broker to understand what's going on with the stock. Same thing, if we can actually take our financial statements and turn them into pictures, because our brains process images faster than it does numbers and letters, and it, our, brain, our brain sees in pictures more than numbers and letters, if we can actually create those the reports that are visually easy to understand, that's a big key to projecting into the future because then you can see those trend lines. You know, if you take any stock chart, right? And I, I'm not a huge stock market investor. I, I'm going to put out a, a, an investor newsletter, which is do the opposite of Spencer and you'll be fine um, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to public markets. But like, you know, if you take any courses on it, you know, they'll draw the top and the bottom like it's a channel. If you look at the stock price over time very rarely does it come outside of that channel. So there is right. some predictability of the future. Timing right. is difficult, right. but the predictability is there and making it visual and easy to understand. So it's not that painful accounting, boring accounting, technical accounting format. That's the game changer right there. So the ability to predict, and we know that that's what's really important as leaders are there, our ability to predict and communicate that so important. So let me just tell a, you know, a quick add to this. So, so you're basically talking about being both visual and auditory. We know there's three types of learning, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Yeah. And when we see our financials in terms of pictures, pie charts, graphs, then we can really get a sense of where things are going or have been. But I had a professor in business school who taught financial management, wrote a number of articles for Harvard Business Review, and he would pound on his chest and say, you have to feel the cash flow. <laughs> and I once had a business partner who was not particularly literate, and, but it was amazing. He knew in our clothing business how many shirts we sold, how much money came in, how much money went out. He literally, because he couldn't read and write too well, he felt it. What, yeah. like... Some people just don't seem to have that feel. And um, that's like another yeah. dimension. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, I, 
I, I wish I talked about the magic in my book. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, there's people, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about a good friend of mine owned a glass uh, fabricating business. So they, they would bring in huge sheets of glass and then cut them down, put them in sealed units, that type of thing. And he, you know, he was in a staff meeting one day and he, he was looking at somebody he goes, yeah, we're going to run out of glass tomorrow. And the production manager's like, no, no, we're fine. Da, da, da. It was, all right. And then the next day, one of the other team members came and was like, yeah, we ran out of glass today. He goes, yep. He just felt it. And that has to do with years and years in the business. Yeah. Um, but some people really struggle with numbers. You know, like if you ask me to draw a painting, you could give me a hundred years and my paintings are still going to suck. And I suspect some people are going to be listening to this rather than watching it. But I'm just going to do a quick share on, oh, I can't share. Um, oh. If you don't mind giving an example of how to paint the picture in literally picture data format. Um, so, Go for it. you know, it's kind of, I'll show you here, this one. Of course, I just hit the pause button for a second, but we're good. So, we're good. yeah, we're all good. This you is know, great. If you, if you look at this, like it's a really simple chart. All we're looking at here is the green line is this year's results. The black line is the budget. Now this company that I pulled up as the example, you'll see budget is zero. That's the future that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the blue line is last year. So we can see, you don't have to be a, a genius to look and see, oh, well this, this month, the month of September, I was above zero for income and above last year. And then year to date, my trend over the year is look, I'm doing way better than I was last year yeah. in income. Sales, same thing. I can see my sales are tracking better both on a monthly basis. I had a little dip here in March and April and probably COVID related. And then, you know, now I'm shooting way above where I was last year. So, you know, taking things, like I said, and, and data visualization, and that's also part of the magic. So when you start to see these charts every month and you're not stuck in spreadsheets and you're not stuck in financial statements, which are painful, now you can actually start to feel it like, oh, I feel like this line is going to go this way. That's yeah. somehow you can actually create some of that magic you were talking about. I, I think you're right. I mean, as a guy who's walked, been a consultant for 30 years and walked into a lot of businesses, yeah. like you can feel the cash flow when you walk into a business. It's like walking into a, a restaurant when the kitchen, like you talk about in your book, you know, yeah. when the kitchen is well organized, the back of the house, you, you know that the front of the house is doing a really good job. And you can feel it in businesses. You can feel like literally like how cash is moving through the business. And if it's healthy or if it's got, you know, um, EOS talks about healthy traction, you know, vision, like you feel that stuff coming together. So that's, that's, yeah. And I will say, I mean, I've seen a lot of financial statements and there are a lot of financials where cash flow is a huge, huge challenge. Like it's, you know, more businesses than not have cash flow challenges out there. Right. Especially if you're carrying inventory or you are, um, yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the, or you're growing super fast. Um, yeah you know, at a faster rate. You know, we used to talk about uh, the growth rate of companies, but we're not going to get into that kind of esoteric uh, thing. Sure. So, we'll um, so that. yeah, you talk about financial hygiene. Yeah. And uh, so tell us what, what is financial hygiene? What's that? What's your definition of that? Yeah. So I kind of use two words at the same time, you know, there's hygiene and insights, and maybe you were going to insights next, but mm -hmm. the accounting hygiene, that's the basic day-to-day. -day. It's probably what you think of as accounting now, but honestly, it's really not for you, the business owner, the business leader. It's right. really for nerds like me who are the accountants, the bankers. If you ever want to buy and sell your business, ever want to finance the business, ever get audited, you know, um, IRS or whatever, they'll, they'll look at your hygiene with a rubber glove. Yep. But my point is it's not for you, right? That was designed for technical people like me. The insights that's actually the stuff that's really meaty and usable for you. That's the stuff that when you get the information presented in the right way, you can actually start to make good decisions based on it. You know, an insight would be like, look, um, you know, this is real data from a, a marketing agency we worked with is, yeah, we did 97 jobs last year. 50 of those 97 jobs, actually, sorry, 57. So call it 60% for easy math represented 8.7% of their gross profits. So half of their company 
prospecting, closing, staffing. And again, it's, this is an ad agency, so they have to actually manage it, execute, check the results, invoice, collect, right? Over and over and over for 8.7, 8.3% of their business. Wow. So that is, to me, is an insight. Yes. That's the difference between hygiene. Here are your debits and credits and a, and a technical income statement I don't understand. And here's an insight that actually comes to you and says, do you get that 60% of our jobs giving us 8% of our contribution is a problem? Yeah, that's intuitive. That's easy to understand. Right. right? And so what actually that company did is they set a new minimum. They raised their minimum. They stopped yep. taking all clients. They replaced those 57 clients with three new clients, the same amount of profitability, three clients. Un unbelievable. The problem though, is that without that hygiene, it's really yes. difficult to get good insights. It's like looking into a cloudy crystal. I think I have one of those here. I mean, to try and make insights by looking into this thing, it's like, it's not going to be clear. Well, you're, you, you have to get your hygiene right. That's, that's kind of a given. Because, right. and, and again, you know, there's four main users of your hygiene. Like I said, banks, if you want to borrow, uh, buyers, if you want to sell, auditors, if you, know, you get the rubber glove treatment. But the fourth user is yourself, but right. not in the format that they're given, in that insights format. Understood. And if you're not getting insights, it's like fighting with one arm tied behind your back, yep. literally. Understood. Okay, so how did you come to do this work? You, you were in a family yeah. business. You were in a cold storage business with your dad. Did, was he naturally good at the books and accounting? Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the backstory here. Yeah, I'll go back just a little before because I've actually had a, a few different businesses and it took me a while to get involved in the family business. So I actually, uh, my first uh, business was a manufacturing business. Mm -hmm. I, I bought that with a partner. Um, and then I got involved in his business, which was a construction business. So I was involved in those two. And then at that point, after about seven or eight years, I felt I had enough to bring to the family business. It was really important for me that I show up and not just be like, hi, I'm the owner's son type of thing. Right. Um, and through a bit of a story, uh, my dad's partner uh, retired, uh, a private equity firm bought out his position. And then there was a balance in terms of who got how many seats on the board. So I joined the board of the family business, mm -hmm. um, which again was a cold storage business. We had four facilities in Washington state. Um, and now, by the way, was it intentional of you not to join the business because you thought you should go out and get other experience yeah. or was, is it something your dad said, son? No, you that, need to go that was me. That was really me. It's just, wow. it's how I'm wired. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's how I was wired more than uh, okay. I just wanted to be able to show up and bring value from day one. I just wanted that's, to cut well, my that, own. That's remarkably mature, by the way, I think, or, well, or entrepreneurial or independent or, or a combination. Sure. I mean, I've doubted that many times, but sure, we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> okay. But actually, you know, to your question of was my dad skilled in that area? My dad is a CPA. Oh, um, okay. and he actually owned a tax practice forever. He's, he's, He's one of the top boutiques tax practitioners in Canada. He focuses on mergers and acquisitions tax work. Mm -hmm. So this was actually an investment he made with his partner, like, I don't know, a hundred years ago kind of thing. He's been in the business a long time. Right. And so, um, you know, when I was finishing university, I'm like, well, what am I going to do next? That's when I got introduced to the CPA program and I didn't even know what I wanted to do. So I, I got my CPA and then when I went off into actual business, for you know the last 20 years now, and it's been the last five years that I realized, wow, there's this huge problem for entrepreneurs. I was sitting in a in a, a financial speaker was doing this talk, really interesting guy, great uh, speaker, but it was over most people's heads who are all entrepreneurs in the room. And you know the joke is, I corrected him at one point. One of his formulas, he made a mistake, and everybody laughed because they didn't know what was going on, and I was correcting him. And the guy at the table who I knew leaned over and said, hey, can you put this in my business for me? And I was just like, oh, OK, I speak both languages. I get what's going on here. Accountants have a hard time understanding what entrepreneurs really need. And entrepreneurs don't know how to tell accountants what they actually need because they sure. don't know. So, so that's why I thought there's an opportunity to create this system. Gotcha. Um, so that's gotcha. what I did. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And so you've worked with uh, a lot of family businesses because most of your clients have shipped financial are in the 
um, sub ten million dollar? Would you say? Yeah, uh, kind of like one to ten, with most of them being, we'll say, kind of two to six to seven ish. Okay. Anything unique, not to put you on the spot, but anything unique about the family businesses versus the non-family businesses? Are you seeing some distinctions there in terms of, I don't know, yeah. their, their knowledge, their, their... You know, it's the dynamic is really what's unique, as I'm sure you more than well know. I experienced it with my dad and learning how to navigate like, oh, all of a sudden we're partners, but this is my dad and, you know, kind of so to me, it's more the dynamic and the dynamic as it relates to getting really good information often has to do with, again, something you know a lot about, maybe legacy systems or legacy ways of doing business because, yeah. you know, dad who started the business 30 years ago and is comfortable doing things a certain way. And then as we're succeed, as the succession is happening and as the family is sort of uh, engaging more at a, at a more senior level, it's like, well, wait a second there are better ways to do things. And just because we've been doing this for 30 years, this isn't going to get us for the next 30 years. So the things that I notice are really the desire of, you know, usually we'll say the, the incoming generation, the second generation to really step up in the systems and process because the old way doesn't work kind of like it used to. Yeah. Well, we, I call those disruptive successors, but probably in the cold storage business, you had one of those. I used to remember you, it was a slide thing out. You pulled it out from the desk and that was the, where the general ledger sat and <laughs> you could write in the general ledger uh, items. And I mean, it was, it was so, it, that company actually was a very successful company. It, uh, I can't tell you the name of it, but they were completely put out of business when, yeah. you know, QuickBooks and other software companies came into existence. Yeah. So. No, we, we were, we were, I, I don't know if lucky is the word or forced in the cold storage business um, because there's so much product coming and going and invoicing and all of that. We were really, you know, we had to have a, a top of the line uh, system to manage all the logistics, but also the accounting. So I'm sure there's custom software for that industry. Yeah. Yep. I'm sure as there are for most industries. Okay. Yeah. So one of the big insights so you talked about insights yeah. and one of the big insights or epiphanies that I had was that there are only like a few ways to really grow a business when you start looking at the math and you have a chapter on financial levers. It's yeah. not a big chapter, but it's a really important chapter is in the middle of the book. And for me, that was the biggest thing that I implemented in my coaching practice. It was like, Hey, look guys, there's five ways we can grow a company meaning we can improve the bottom line. Yeah. And I just want you to focus on these five things. Don't yeah. get lost in the, you know, in the, the trees, in the forest. And you talk about that in your book. Like, you know, if you don't do a lot of travel, like don't get lost in like, how much did you spend on, you know, you know, meals on or travel outside of town, like focus on the big items, which is basically your top line, your middle line and your bottom line. Yeah. As, and you know, and I think, people get hung up on travel or office expenses a lot because they understand it. And it seems right. like something they have control over, right. but really, unless you have things, you know, your expenses are out of control. Yeah. It's your sales, it's your cost of goods and it's your expenses on the income statement side. That's really all. Those are your three levers. Those are the only things you can do. And I find for a lot of entrepreneurs like, Oh, now I, yeah, I actually don't have to worry about this, all the complexity. I just need to shine a light on which of those levers is causing me a problem and which one, if I pull it, is going to actually make the biggest difference in my business. Same thing on the balance sheet. We've got accounts receivable, we've got inventory, and we've got accounts payable. Those are really the three things you can pull. Some people are argue capital equipment. Some people argue debt. But for simplicity, for me, the number is six. Right. Understood. And, yeah. you know, so the same um, analogy or metaphor for sales marketing was, it's how many leads did you generate? Yep. What was your conversion rate? Yep. You know, what was the average uh, ticket price? And yep. was there, by the way, was there like recurring revenue? Was that it was some frequency? And so those were, were some of the big things. Um, yeah. No, I and, think that's a great analogy. I really like that. In fact, yeah. I'm probably yep. going to steal it just so you know. <laughs> yeah. So um, you'll find uh, it's not up there yet. But my tools are available on the Disruptive Successor website. And the tool that's going to go up there is this like unlimited marketing calculator type thing, which is awesome. the five ways to grow a business. And they're very similar um, to your levers. Love it. So, love it. Okay, great. So uh, I know you're passionate about accounting and finance and entrepreneurship and 
blending the two. Um, so let's just uh, share a little bit about you. I know you're also into uh, sports and marathon running. Um, so uh, is there an analogy between endurance sports and running businesses to you? Um, well, I, I actually did a presentation uh, this morning and uh, I like telling a story. So yeah, I do marathons. I actually have run a bunch of ultra marathons. Okay. Um, I've run as far as a hundred miles. And yep. Uh, so the, the, the joke that I kind of come up with, and I won't go through the whole thing right now, but essentially, you know, you run for a hundred miles, that's 200,000 steps, footfalls, at, you know, over 30 hours, what we took me, that's a lot of chafing, right? And the yes. chafing isn't on your hands, which are tough skin. It's the chafing right. is, you know, in your, uh, between your butt cheeks, right? Like that's yes. where you take. Yes. And so, you know, the, the, the pain of accounting for small and medium business owners the emotional and mental pain is as real as the physical pain of running hundred miles, right? There was actually a survey of 10,000 small and medium business owners that 40% said bookkeeping and taxes was the worst part of owning a business. That's nearly half of entrepreneurs think what we're talking about is the worst part of owning a business. Wow. Like that's literally like chafing your butt cheeks for 30 hours. Like that's how painful this is. So to me, that's the analogy where, you know, this is painful, but there's actually tools like, you know, I don't go out for a run without using body glide, which is an anti-chafe balm. And, you know, at the risk of too much information, I put tape on my nipples so they don't chafe either. Cause you get yes. a t-shirt yes. running like this for yes. six hours and you'll, you know, bloody nipples, sorry, but it happens. So yep. I have tools for running that make sure I don't get knocked out of a race because of those types of things. Similarly, there's tools in business. You know, we talked about it already, the, the, uh, the data visualization, putting things in easy to understand, getting your insights in place, understanding where in your business you're making money and where you're not. You know, like what if I told you, uh, I don't know, let's pick an example. You're, uh, uh, you're, you're an online store and you're selling products. Well, what if I told you these 16 products made you 80% of your revenue and these 80 products made you 20% of your revenue, right? That's insight that you can actually be like, okay, so what you're telling me is I need to find more of these and get rid of these. Yeah. So, you know, the same tools, the body glide and the tape, that's no different than insights and data visualization. There's tools that are going to help you succeed in either. Very good. Very it good. It doesn't have so, to be as painful as it seems if you get it done I, right. I, uh, I, I understand. And I can't underscore the importance of the work that you do. Um, I'm a big fan also of some of the personal developments. So, well, we could call this like endurance type sports. Yeah. I've done a 508 mile uh, bike race. Oh, wow. I, I did it with a team, so I, yeah. I won't uh, won't kid you. But I've done many centuries on my bike. I've put in a lot of miles, and I, and I know yeah. it's about having the right tools and the right equipment, and it's about being coached and trained in the best way to do it. Like it took me riding with an endurance athlete who did ultra you know, ultra long distance to understand yeah. about hydration and yeah. about fueling and eating. I mean, these are all things and, that you close, you know, like, you know, you yep. go out one day and all of a sudden you're freezing. So, you know, you got to get a little jacket that you can stuff in your back pocket and yep. you got to learn all these secrets. And, but once you have them, then you can be out comfortably riding your century. Yep. So, yeah. so, well, it's great. It's nice to know that you're the Dean Carnesis of uh, of the um, bookkeeping. <laughs> oh, we don't like Dean Carnesis. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just shaking my head because that guy. <laughs> I, I I would never compare myself to him. He's uh, he's a pretty unique cat. He is a pretty unique cat. Um, so, what haven't we covered? What do we? What else is left to cover? I think we've we've covered yeah. some of the basics, but. Question. No, I think we've done really well. I think, um, you know, there's a bunch of free resources at entrepreneurnumbers.com. Right. Um, you know, there's examples of what a really great reporting package could look like. So feel free to download that, bring it to your account and say, I want something that's more like this. Uh, there's information, there's, you know, a, a questionnaire on, you know, what if you're worried if your bookkeeper isn't strong enough? There's actually kind of five high level questions you can ask there to test to see, you know, are they going to pass? So there's a bunch of free resources there. You're, you're more than welcome to have. They're all free. So uh, my goal is I believe entrepreneurs can change the world. And my job is to help them through their financial blind spots. So, 
those are some of my gifts to uh, to share out with uh, with other entrepreneurs. Sounds good. So the best way for them to reach you is through the book Entrepreneur Numbers and the website or through yeah, Shift Financial. Com is where yep. you can get the downloads and or Spencer at shiftfinancial.co, not .com, Spencer at shiftfinancial.co. Yes, the Canadians always do things just a little differently than we do. No, so. I want the .com, <laughs> but honestly, somebody reserved it and they're holding it for ransom. And I just refuse to pay ransom for web name, domain names. Okay, note to editor, cut that part out of this, but uh, no. All right, we're good. So thank you so much, Spencer, for sharing your wisdom. I hope people will contact you. This is Jonathan Goldhill, and you. this is a show by, for, and about family businesses. And I hope you'll tune in and listen to more experts like Spencer Shanin. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Disruptive Successor Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, review, and share with a friend who would benefit from the message. If you're interested in picking up a copy of my book, Disruptive Successor, go to disruptivesuccessor.com.